Good evening. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Nayland Blake, who is the Bill and Stephanie Sick Distinguished Visiting Professor. Each academic year, SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a variety of public presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical resource and inspiration for our community. And tonight, we're honored to host Neil and Blake and have them become a part of our rich history of distinguished guests who have spoken at the school. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 10 minutes to take three or four questions from the audience before the program concludes by 7.30. Our staff will have microphones circulating for your use. We ask that if you are posing a question to please stand and share your name and to keep your question concise. So thank you again for joining us tonight. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Alyssa Tenney, SAC's president. Thanks, Andrea, and welcome to everyone. I want to give a very special welcome to Stephanie Sick, who in 2006 established with her husband, Bill, this distinguished visiting professorship that bears their name. Bill and Stephanie's generous gift has enabled us to bring internationally renowned artists and designers, many of whom do not teach or they teach far away, to partner with SAIC faculty and teach our students. This extraordinary program has brought such luminaries as Andrea Zettel, Jaime Plenza, Chris Ware, Anne Hamilton, and last year, Amanda Williams, among many others, to campus. Please help me thank Bill and Stephanie with a round of applause. And Stephanie is right here. And today, of course, we welcome the phenomenal Naylin Blake as the newest Bill and Stephanie Sick Distinguished Professor. To introduce Naylin, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium an interdisciplinary artist whose talents as a teacher earned him the Chairman's Award last year and who is now serving as our Dean of Faculty. Please help me welcome Jefferson Pinder. Thank you, Andrea and Alyssa. And again, welcome everyone to this evening's lecture. We are so excited to be starting this academic year with this presentation. I have the pleasure and great honor to introduce Naylan Blake as an artist whose practice is more than a few steps ahead of the curve, and it's always been ahead of its time. Very much engaged in contemporary thought, Blake's work intersects an array of conversations regarding personal and public struggles of identity and representation. Utilizing a seemingly light satire and humor, their work packs a punch challenging their viewers and critics to question the established ideologies. Working and making during a time in which identity exploration is often nuanced than what initially is seen by the eye, Blake seeks to explore all dimensions of dialogue surrounding race, gender, sexuality, and difference. Since the 1980s, Blake has made a name for themselves under the umbrella of identity art long before the term was even coined, creating language for previously unaddressed issues like HIV awareness during the AIDS crisis and the complex body politics of today. Blake is a pioneer in the field of social practices in which they have masterfully navigated through and around cultural stereotypes and social tropes to find new and powerful meaning in the everyday adventures of being. As a queer, African-American, self-identified feminist, Blake is an artist who embodies intersectionality in their work as they do in life itself. For Blake, teaching, curating, making is all part of the same project. And at all of this, they are extremely successful. Since starting their career in San Francisco and New York City in the mid-1980s, their work has been included in permanent collections in such institutions as the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of Art, the Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum of Harlem, to name a few. They are a recipient of the John S. Guggenheim Fellowship, and they were included in the 1991 Whitney Biennial. A longtime artist represented by Matthew Marks Gallery, they have helped to establish new consciousness in the contemporary art scene. 
Blake represents an independent spirit that is more relevant now and needed more now than ever before. With themes and ideas ranging from consumption habits to queer mixers in the museum spaces, they challenge the viewer and the art world to reconsider the possibilities of open communities in which boundaries are fluid and relationships are infinitely more complex and more beautiful because of it. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the 2019 Bill and Stephanie Sick Distinguishing um, Visiting Lecturer, or I'm sorry, Visiting Professor, Nayland Blake. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you um, so much for, uh, for that introduction that I will never be able to live up to. But um, it is, uh, I, am, I am really honored to be here. Um, uh, I'm really glad to be starting off a new uh, academic year with y'all, whether or not you are students. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, extremely grateful. Um, generally, the way that I do these talks, I sort of, I try to sort of feel out um, from a number of people uh, uh, here at the School of the Art Institute. Um, so what are these talks like? Like, I'm supposed to be like delivering like a, you know, is this like a homily in church? Like what am I, like a, you know, am I, is this rabbinical exegesis? What's supposed to happen here? And everyone was really like, oh, do what you want to do. Like, it's fine, like do, do, you know. Everyone will be glad to just see what you show. So, um, <laughs> so we will test that thesis. Um, <laughs> um, I, what I'm going to do is uh, take you on a kind of rapid fire trip through the work um, from the past, um, I guess, uh, close to 40 years at this point. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to show you things. Uh, both from um, my undergraduate experience and, uh, and uh, graduate school, um, and then up to um, an exhibition that I opened in Los Angeles two days ago. So you're getting the full span of things. Um, and my tendency is to kind of show you all a lot, kind of quickly, and then, um, and then as we get into sort of question time, it gets easier to kind of talk about how things kind of go together. I'll do, I'll lay some groundwork, but then, um, but then we'll move pretty rapidly. Um, usually, I mean, given that we have this format, usually we have a, I, I, I like to let people kind of interrupt with questions, um, uh, but we won't do that tonight. What I normally say is if you have a question that's about a specific piece, like how big is that, or when did you make that, or um, you know, what is that made out of, I would you know, normally answer that question while the slide was up and asking people to, you know, if you had a question that was like, well, what were you thinking of when you made that, or um, what, what, what were you thinking of when you made that, or or you know why are we born to suffer and die? And sort of asking that people hold those questions for the end. Um, so I, but we're going to hold all questions to the end. So that'll that'll sort that out. Um, to briefly give you a sense about myself, um, I was born in 1960 uh, in uh, New York City, um, and. Uh, Grew up there um, in high school uh, or, or junior high and high school. I fell in um, with a bunch of uh, fellow students and we were sort of art nerds. And so we went around to like art stuff. That was the way that we, you know, proved to ourselves that we were better than everybody else is that we knew about obscure art in New York City. Um, so that I kind of grew up seeing the New York art world 
like it was the thing that I sort of imprinted on as a baby bird, you know, as a place of possibility. Um, and uh, of course, looking at that now, that's an extremely um, naive uh, view of what was going on in that time. But, you know, um, often naivete is the thing that saves us um, when um, cynicism throws us under the bus. So, um, uh, at the end of high school, um, I had some friends who had gone to Bard. I decided I was going to go to Bard College as well. Um, and I, it, I want to sort of talk about, Bard was interesting, it was a sort of stealth art school. Um, it was staffed by artists who were actual artists, who, who had careers. Most of them lived in New York City and would come up, you know, and, and teach. Um, and then go back to it, which was a little unusual at the time. Most colleges at that point that were liberal arts colleges had people who didn't really have ongoing um, artistic careers or lives. And, um, and that was one of the things I was really hungry for, was like, what was, the, what was this life going to be like? What was the life of an artist actually going to be like? Um, so that was kind of a great thing about Bard. Um, one of the odd things about Bard, and it's a thing that I, I sort of want to talk about in general, is that, you know, every art school has, um, has the, the work that succeeds in it. And, and every art school has what we call, like, good students, right? Successful students. Um, and um, at Bard in the, in the late 70s, if you were a good student, um, what you ended up doing was making um, large, um, large sort of brushy abstract oil paintings. And they were um, brushy because you were supposed to be using your whole arm. Arm gesture was better than wrist gesture. Like there was something suspicious about someone who was doing this. Um, they were supposed to be big so that you could move the whole arm. Um, they were oil because at the time, like the pigment density of oil paint was so much better than that of acrylic paint. And, um, and also they were abstract because, well, you know, Representation was for goofballs who hadn't quite figured it out yet. Um, so as I started out at Bard, I was trying to sort of make these paintings. I could never really figure out how to make them. Um, this is not one of those paintings. Uh, to give you a good sense, one of the reasons why this painting was a problem is that it was um, like eight inches square. So, um, and it's acrylic. Sin upon sin. That's amazingly enough not representational, but. Um, so uh, I kept sort of trying to figure out how to like make these things, how to, how to make those kinds of paintings. I could never get them to be large. I tended to always make sort of small things. Um, you know, here's sort of another iteration on these stripe paintings. Again, it's acrylic. Um, but I started shaping the canvas. This is, uh, you know, maybe this is 12 inches by 8 inches. Um, at Bard, if you were an intellectual, you made large, abstract, hard-edged, geometric oil paintings because somehow geometry meant intellect. Like you were thinking things through because you had a ruler in your hand. Um, uh, math is hard, as we know. Um, yeah, I, I ended up like kind of sticking these, like this is made out of like toilet paper and spray paint and acrylic paint. It's just getting like worse and worse and worse. Um, and then finally something happened, which uh, was that I encountered um, the, uh, the work of uh, one visiting artist, someone who came and lectured at Bard, and then I also had an art experience. Um, the, le the visiting artist was uh, the artist Judy Pfaff, who at that time was just um, beginning to make installations, um, beginning to make work that filled entire spaces. 
Um, and the art experience was going to something called the Times Square Show, which is um, a show in 1980, in the summer of 1980 in New York City, where a group of artists um, uh, known as CoLab um, took over an abandoned um, massage parlor in the middle of Times Square, um, sort of when Times Square was at its, at its um, uh, most piquant, I guess you could say. Um, and uh, they filled, they organized a show that went on for a month and filled the space with work. None of it labeled. So it was like walking into this amazing fun house of all of these different sorts of um, objects and paintings and stuff ev on every surface. And it suddenly struck me that that was a way that I could potentially work. Um, that instead of simply trying to make one big sort of unified idea, I could make a lot of small incidental ideas and put them together and, and fill the space with them. So that led to um, my final project at BARD, which was a big installation. Um, I took over an abandoned theater in there um, on the campus and worked for a month um, filling it up with stuff. Um, in the center of the space, I built a, a little observatory slash studio. Um, and on the table in the space was a book that had all of my preparatory drawings and sketches and notes um, for the piece. So the idea was that you could be out in this kind of chaotic space and then walk in and kind of decode it by looking at all of the drawings and, and all of the notation. Um, so, having figured out some way of being able to work, I was ready to graduate and to go on to graduate school, and I went to CalArts. Um, CalArts, like Bard, had a similar situation. All art schools have some form of working that, um, that uh, is um, not exactly the default, but is more, more successful, and they had the same thing as, a good, as, as good students. They had good students at CalArts. Um, and if you were a good student at CalArts, what you did um, for your thesis show was that you posted a piece of typewritten paper on the door to the gallery that explained that you were deconstructing the notion of gallery space by refusing to include anything inside of it. Um, again, a proposition that I could not quite wrap my head around. So this is sort of my final show at CalArts. Um, Chris, this is the L-shape gallery um, that over one weekend I turned into the N-shape um, in, a, in a fit of, um, you know, egomania and um, gave myself my first retrospective. That's me. This is 1984. You can tell it's 1984 by my, like, elegantly draped crop top t-shirt and <laughs> off the shoulder uh, um, overalls there. So I built all of this stuff. I built the bench, I built the display platforms, I built the furniture that was on the display platforms, the work, um, and I recreated my studio from, uh, from downstairs in the building in a kind of, um, you know, mocking homage to like the relics of artists um, up in the space there. So finished up at CalArts. Um, at that time, everybody that I knew uh, in the program was doing one or two things. They were either moving to New York to pursue their career or they were staying in Los Angeles and working there. Um, I'm a person who's never learned how to drive so staying in Los Angeles um, would have stretched my mooching skills to the limit. Um, and, uh, and I knew at the time that my work was not formed enough um, to really be able to withstand the pressures of New York. I had friends who had graduated before me or who were there pursuing careers and I watched them um, 
you know, kind of frantically chasing whatever idea was sort of current in the art world at the time. And I knew that I would get easily caught up in that kind of a, that kind of a, 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 you know, a race. And that my own sense of what it was that I wanted to make wasn't developed enough to be able to, um, to you know, to get past that. So I decided to move to Los, move to San Francisco, a place where um, there was reasonable public transportation and you did not have to drive um, to live there. Also, it was the queer capital, and I was really interested in trying to figure out how to make work that was um, about. A, um, about a queer experience at the time. So we're talking like 1984. Um, this is the first show that I had in San Francisco at a place called New Langton Arts, uh, an artist-run nonprofit. Um, this is 1985, and um, it's an installation. Uh, I'll show you, you sort of entered, there was that, that wall there, you came around the back. You saw this, and then you came out the other side. Um, so what's going on on this wall is, again, sort of all of these preparatory drawings and all this other stuff. I got done with this show, and I was profoundly disappointed. I had been out of school for a year. I'd had my first opportunity for a public exhibition, and I had made this thing um, that I felt let down by for two reasons. One. Um, Everything in this space was kind of ephemeral and chaotically thrown together. And by the end of the show, there really wasn't much of anything for me to be able to reflect upon or to think about. Um, there was just really kind of a lot of debris. And secondly, um, I sort of relied on this um, use of the drawings and the writing to sort of explicate what was going on in the chaotic space again. So to my mind, what I had done was, when confronted with a new situation, I had taken a step backwards into something I felt comfortable with, which was the kind of work that I was making while I was at Bard. So I took some time and realized that I needed to rethink the way I was working and I needed to give myself some rules. Um, the two rules were, um, going forward, I wanted to make self-sufficient objects that were self-contained, and that also they were things that I would be willing to live with and look at for a longer period of time. So here's the following year. Uh, this is an exhibition at a space called uh, Media in San Francisco. So 1986. Um, so what's going on at this point is that I'm sort of going into thrift stores, I'm finding stuff, I'm starting to alter the stuff that I'm finding and, and making these um, sort of condensed objects out of it. Um, I also started to get interested in the idea of having an activity going on while the show was happening. So uh, in this piece, uh, which is called 500 Kisses, um, I printed two sets of cards. Uh, one says final on one side and fluid on the other. The other says safe on one side and seen on the other. At the beginning of the show, I pitched half of the cards towards the hat and then the rest were left there for people who visited the show to pitch during the course of the show. Um, so I finished up with that show and felt like, okay, I've answered some of the questions that I had in relationship to the work, um, but of course that raises new questions. And I also found that I had sort of fallen into a kind of methodology um, that uh, was getting a little too comfortable. So one of the things that's consistently, um, that I've tried to do in the work over and over again is that when I find something that succeeds in the work, 
I try to um, question that and, uh, and reinvestigate it before it becomes a kind of crutch or a kind of prop for the work. Um, so I, so there I was, you know, I was like finding these kind of weathered objects. I was slapping some evocative text on them and boom, you had art, right? Um, and I started to think, okay, what happens if I take some of that stuff away? What happens if I separate it out? One thing I thought was whenever we encounter an object, we encounter it with language. So I don't need to write something on the piece. People already have words in their head in relationship to the thing that they're seeing. Um, so I started doing a, a series of pieces that were about different substances. Um, this is water, wine, vinegar, piss. Uh, this is a piece called After Veronica. Um, it is uh, men's handkerchiefs that have been stained with a variety of substances. So um, sweat, semen, blood, carbon, um, um, uh, wax, and then um, framed and tagged, uh, like with these sort of specimen tags. Um, I then took the words and decided I was just going to treat them as their own thing. And so I started making these sign paintings. I always thought this was a good thing for a painting to say. Um, this is a piece called March. So uh, from 1987, for the month of March, uh, every day I had an apple. Um, I took the core and dated it and tagged it and then preserved it in a jar with vodka. So this is 31 apple cores for um, the 31 days. Um, I also started to think about like, okay, what happens if I bring together materials that will suggest a use um, without necessarily um, activating them myself? says, don't waste it. Piece called Natural History One. Um, I also started to try to think about what's the relationship between uh, where the work is being shown um, and, the thing it, and, and the thing itself. So um, media, the gallery that this was shown in, was uh, a couple of blocks away from uh, a famous San Francisco dance bar called the D the Stud, and this is um, the the flag that the Stud flew outside of the building um, with the letters rearranged. So it's the same typeface with the letters rearranged. Um, some stereo photography. So again, things were sort of progressing along. I felt like there were some points where um, there was, uh, again, I was sort of relying on the same effects over and over again. One of them was this sort of sense of antiqueness, the sort of patina that everything had. Um, and I got very suspicious of that. So I decided to try to make things that were um, contemporary, that, that did not look like they were antiques. So that led to these workstation pieces. Piece called Restraint Chair. Uh, hog tie. Piece called Flush. Um, and then taking the words uh, from those sort of um, patinaed sign paintings and silk screening them onto chalkboards. So this is two different um, translations of a passage from Leopold von Sacher Masoch's book, Venus and Furs. He's the person that masochism is named for. Um, and the thing that was interesting to me about this is that each one of them is the rendition of a painting, but that there's a third painting that you are making that hovers in between the two of them. 
that you're making up out of the sort of the, the fragments of their of both of their references. Uh, this is from a pamphlet that I found on the street in San Francisco um, that was called The Many Faces of Addiction. Uh, we never figured out like what it was about codeine that it occupies like the nexus of all addiction. <laughs> like do not, don't worry about the nicotine, don't worry about like the morphine, it's the codeine you gotta watch out for. Uh, Oscar Wilde's initials. A uh, piece based on uh, the Hanky Code. Um, so, in thinking about like getting rid of the antiqueness of the work, I decided that I would also investigate that more fully by researching a specific time period. And that led me to making a series of installations, which I've called suites for one, one reason or another. Um, this is the first one of those. It's called the Schreber Suite. It was done at the University Art Museum in Berkeley. Um, and basically, these shows tend to be combinations of curatorial projects and installations. Um, this piece was based on a book by, uh, Lee, um, by Daniel Paul Schreber, um, a 19th century German judge called Memoirs of My Nervous Illness. Um, it is uh, a book that Freud used in uh, his uh, Three Case Histories to um, uh, sort of postulate a, uh, a homosexual basis for paranoia. Um, and what I did was go back to Schreber's text, um, combine it with some things that I made in, in reference to the text, and then also um, connect it up with works from the museum's collection that were contemporaneous with the text. Uh, some further work. So now we're like 1989 or so. A piece called Sh Schatzman Hallucination Guide. Um, Valerie Solanus's Scum Manifesto. Um, from silk screening onto the chalkboards, I started silk screening directly onto the wall and then also leaving the thing that uh, sort of created the mark there on the there next to it. Uh, this is a project for um, an art magazine uh, based in the Bay Area um, called Shift. So for a while I had a, an alter ego, uh, Princess Coco. Um, and so as you can see, the work is getting more and more elaborately fabricated and there's more and more production going into it. And I started really missing um, the experience of like going and rummaging around in thrift stores and pulling things out and putting them together. And I also began to ask myself a question that I, has continued to this day, which is, what is the stuff that is in my life that I'm, that I'm in contact with all the time that I'm not allowing into the work? And I think um, for all of us, uh, it's an important question. So these pieces are sort of the first stab at that. These are um, mass market paperbacks um, uh, in plexiglass boxes. I would basically buy the group of books at one go um, and sort of organize them. Um, so to just give you a sense, um, I have some close-ups, but um, on the left is um, Larry Kramer's book, Faggots, The Hobbit, The Hobbit, The Hobbit, 
faggots. I actually have a laser pointer. There we go. Yes, faggots, the hobbit, the hobbit, the hobbit, faggots. So that's faggots and hobbits. Um, we've got a, we've got a close-up here of this one. Uh, this is all of the um, Eric Von Daniken Chariots of the Gods books. Um, this is uh, the Christine Jorgensen story, um, the Iliad, the James Coco Diet, the Trouble with Tribbles, the Christine Jorgensen story. So uh, here's the close-up of the other one that was there, Exorcist the Omen, the Omen 2, the Exorcist. Um, the Complete Jacqueline Suzanne Library. Uh, Triple Shining. So one of the reasons, one of the, the things about making those pieces was that um, these were books that I had all, that I had read and that my friends had read and yet um, we would never admit to that. We would, it was always like you, we were always fixated on the latest sort of theory. Um, and, it, you know, it, it always seemed really odd to me, this idea that um, some subject, some part of your life, as you were actually living it, was somehow unacceptable when you were going to move into the art world. Um, and I think that there's um, political reasons for that, obviously, there's class reasons for that. Um, but it's important, I think, for us to be able to dismantle that stuff. So, um, so that was sort of the first step at sort of looking at these things were sort of around me. Um, this is a public project for a, uh, um, a bus shelter um, in, uh, an, in San Francisco for an event called Art Against AIDS on the Road, uh, where artists were asked to um, develop projects for billboards, buses, and bus shelters. This is sort of directly across from City Hall. Um, a year later, this is another piece um, also developed for a benefit calendar uh, for this for this organization um, uh, called Every 12 Minutes. Now we're on to 1990 and a group of works um, uh, that are again kind of looking at um, medical issues and restraints, a uh, piece called Head Hog Tie, uh, Shiny Shiny. Uh, this is a canvas restraint. Um, this is, it's a little bit hard to see the scale of this, but this is, um, uh, that's about 12 feet long and it's about 12 feet tall. So that's a dual, um, a dual canvas restraint. A piece called Feeder. Um, I started doing a lot of work with puppets. Uh, so this is a wall-mounted puppet stage. Uh, part of a group of pieces called Hysterical Arrangement. Um, an early video uh, made for um, a show in a gallery that a friend of mine opened. Uh, a friend is uh, named Rick Jacobson. He opened a gallery called Kiki in San Francisco um, and uh, one of his first shows was a show called Sick Joke, um, uh, black humor in the first decade of AIDS. Um, Rick himself was um, uh, diagnosed uh, with AIDS around that time. Um, this is a piece called Negative Bunny. Uh, it's a half hour long piece where this bunny sort of harangues you about um, letting him and that you should really let him, because um, he's really negative, because he's negative, he's so negative. Um, by the end of the half hour, you know exactly how negative he is. Um, this is uh, another piece from around the time called Magic. Uh, this is uh, Wayland Flower's puppet, Madam. 
Um, I tried to sort of step away from the uh, a lot of the stainless steel and leather and and uh, and rubber, and began making some things uh, that were more about um, a different language of materials. So these are um, what I called bouquet pieces. They're artificial flowers and bent willow letters. Each one of them is a word. This is poof, uh, rim. Uh, there's a bunch more of those. Uh, this is a piece called The 70s. Uh, it's one album from my collection of records, uh, one album from each year from 19, uh, 1970 to, uh, what is it? It's 71 to 80, I think. Uh, another piece um, using records. Piece called Saved and Damned. Homunculus. Uh, piece made during a residency um, in London in 1992. Um, what, what's happening here, you can see in the back there is a table with um, a hot plate and a pot and a mold, and um, during the run of the show, I was cooking down chocolate and wax and casting these heads and then mounting them on this, uh, on this uh, cage structure. A piece called Arena. Oops. So um, we started to go from the puppets into these sort of costumes. Um, a piece called Flayed. Heavenly Bunny Suit, a uh, piece called The Little One. This is a China bisque doll. It's about 12 inches long with a sort of protective puffy suit for it. Um, equipment for a shameful epic. It's basically all of the props and costumes that you need uh, to perform a script that I, that I wrote that's there on the rack. A uh, piece called Blind. Uh, basically, um, during the run of the show, you could buy an hour of my time uh, in this uh, bunny suit, wearing this blindfold and gag, and kind of chained up in this bower structure. And so we would videotape the hour and send that to you. Reversible bunny suit. Uh, another one of these suite pieces, this is the, the, um, the Philosopher Suite. It is an installation that is uh, built around various interpretations of the Marquis de Sade's book, Philosophy in the Bedroom. So basically, the, we performed, the text itself is in the form of a play. Um, and so we had different stagings of the play. So this is um, sets and marionettes from the marionette production. Um, the next suite is uh, uh, using uh, Ralph Ellison's book, Invisible Man. Um, this is at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, again, it involves um, a series of actions um, within the museum, and then also items from the museum's collection. Um, the, the, uh, the, the piece sort of combined the play, um, Harvey, uh, with, um, with Ellison's novel. Um, both of them were written around the same time, and, uh, and, and basically I uh, um, made surrogates of various pieces uh, in the museum's collection and then brought them into this installation in this altar. Um, this is the, so that was 1994. This is the next year, a show in Los Angeles. It's a little bit hard to figure out what's going on here, but um, 
that is the tallest thing in the space, and that's about 14 inches tall. So when you walk into the space, you're basically towering over everything that's in it. A uh, piece called Ritualized Satanic Abuse. Uh, one down. Colder and colder. Um, a few uh, a, a few pieces from around the same period based on this uh, Pinocchio silhouette. So kind of a return to those book pieces, except these are um, pornographic novels uh, sandwiched between these Pinocchio cutouts. Um, around the same time, I was um, commissioned to design a piece for the main branch of the public library in San Francisco. So this is a piece called Constellation. Um, here you are looking at the piece from across the rotunda. Um, and you see this sort of scattering of lights on this green wall. Um, when you get onto the staircase that wraps around the wall, you can see that the lights are actually the names of authors that have been etched onto mirrors and illuminated from behind, um, lighting up the name on the front of the mirror and then casting the name as a shadow on the back. Um, the author's names are all authors who are in the library's collection, and uh, we put together a series of um, public meetings and had an advisory council from of Bay Area scholars and authors to suggest names um, for the for the wall. Um, still small paintings. This is these are like uh, nine by ten. It's a little frightening to see them on this projected on this scale. Uh, following year, um, this is a show in Los Angeles called Hair Hole. A piece called Scarecrow. Um, what's going on here is that occasionally I give myself assignments when I get stuck. So this was an assignment for, to make a piece a day um, for, uh, for the month of March. So they're sort of laid out in the calendar. Around the same time, I started to get really involved in drawing again. Um, and then a performance from that year um, called Bunny Slumber, um, where I uh, was in a hotel room um, uh, during an event basically asleep and we handed out disposable cameras to people to take pictures with them. Uh, this is the following year, um, more of these drawings. a piece called Ibeji. So one of the things that I was trying to look at here was um, sort of two art-making legacies, both a European one and an African one. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually a piece called um, 20 at 1619, um, uh, looking at the first um, recorded arrival of African slaves in the US. Um, 97, I was commissioned by um, the Brooklyn Academy of Music to um, uh, create a performance with some collaborators. It's a piece called Hair Follies. Um, my two collaborators are the choreographer Ishmael Houston Jones, uh, dancer uh, Patricia Hoffbauer. Uh, 
Um, a, sh a show from the following year uh, called um, uh, April Hair, uh, one uh, piece a day for the month of April. So this is the first piece in the show called Clown White Target, uh, Double Surrender, uh, Erased Space Jam Bootleg, uh, Gray Rabbit Made As Tall As Me By Stretching Its Neck, Uh, shit molding kit. Um, and the last piece in the show, burnt cork target. Uh, the next year, a piece called Feeder 2. Um, uh, steel and gingerbread, about 7 feet by 7 feet by 10 feet. And it was shown in conjunction with this video, Gorge. Um, during the course of which, it's an hour-long video um, where I'm being fed a series of food, uh, foods by, um, by this gentleman. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, whoops, um, I've performed Gorge live a number of times. So this is um, 2000 and nine, I guess. Uh, I was asked to do a project for an interiors magazine called Nest, and what I proposed was to panel my mom's bedroom in gingerbread. So that's mom um, with, her, with her house full of gingerbread. A uh, piece called Steel Cage Match. So one of the things that's happening here, again, asking this question, what about the stuff that's in um, our life that we don't allow into the work? You know, I had been in a relationship, this is the year 2000, I'd been in a relationship with someone since 1990, and yet the work didn't really talk about what it meant to be in a couple. And so I was, I was trying to think about, like, how do you make work about coupledom? Um, a piece called Wrong Banyan. There are a bunch of large drawings around this time as well. Uh, server, that's a tar, uh, steel, and angel food cake. Um, so another one of these pieces about coupledom is a piece called Starting Over. Um, it is a performance where I am wearing a suit that has been weighted so it is the same weight as um, my partner at the time. And I'm learning a dance routine that he is teaching me from off camera until I'm physically incapable of doing it any longer. A uh, piece called Ruins of a Sensibility. Um, this is uh, my record, my vinyl record collection um, uh, with a DJ setup. Um, and uh, basically, anyone can sign up to, for sessions DJing with the records. Um, on the back wall is a painting that I made uh, with my father when I was four years old. So this is sort of my first memory. Um, and that painting is hung in my parents' living room, um, except for those times when it's um, shown as part of this. So I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm, I just took a look at what time it is. Um, this is work from a show in 2004. Um, that uh, was really looking at notions of internalized racism. A piece called The Big One. Uh, failed Utopias. We decided to make a gorge lunchbox. Um, couple of these drawings that have been, that we, you know. 
So one of the things that's become really important is a sort of daily drawing practice. And now I, for the past, I'd say, five years, I draw every day. Um, this is a piece called Endless Comfort. Uh, so in 2004, um, uh, the partner that I had mentioned uh, died unexpectedly. And um, I had spent sort of the next year not really able to make anything until I made kind of a series of works that were in some ways looking at our, um, looking at the legacy of our relationship together. We had actually been broken up for a couple of years before his death, but it was kind of a shock when it happened. Uh, this piece called Companion. Um, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to me um, working in galleries at that point, or I was started to really kind of question what the effectiveness of it was. Um, and so I started making a lot of work just out on the street, and basically what was going on here was I would find a piece of garbage, I would draw on it, and put it back where I had found it. Um, on the back, I would write a gift for you from the Department of Transformation. And they were kind of pieces that were there for whoever the next person was who came along and found them. Um, I'll tell you like what happened with the, you know, the book pieces that I was talking about, right? The book pieces in the plexiglass boxes. What ended up happening with those is that I stopped putting them in plexiglass boxes and I would just go to thrift stores and rearrange their paperback book section. And so those were pieces that would just sort of exist for whoever was the next person who came along in the thrift store. Um, and pieces that would sort of disperse as people bought books or cleaned up after them. Or, um, and that idea of something that's just there for a bit um, and, then, uh, and then moves on or that someone might happen on um, uh, and, you know, in, a, in a kind of serendipity I think was important. Um, I started uh, making pieces out of stuff that I found on the street as I was walking my dog. So this is October necklace. It's one piece, one thing that I picked up off of the street each day for the month of October. Um, a project for visual aids in New York, a sticker project um, that we passed out stickers for people to write um, where and when they had had romantic encounters on the streets of New York. And then the next gallery show is started, was out of this stuff that I was starting to assemble, all this scrap. And basically what started happening was that I started working in this kind of improvisatory way where um, I would go to the space for like a week before the show was supposed to open with a bunch of materials and then improvise the show out of those materials over the course of the week. Um, this idea of the show kind of coming into being and evolving while it was happening uh, led to this project, which is a piece called um, Free Love Toolbox, um, a project for Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. And it's a piece that, it's an, in, it was a uh, like four month long installation that looked at the history of San Francisco's South of Market leather community, and also its um, sort of queer punk moment in the in the early 90s, um, through the lens of how those those communities have been kind of displaced by development in San Francisco and gentrification in the in the subsequent years. So it was trying to call forth that history into the space again through a series of activities. Um, 
That wall of shelves that you see there was designated for people to bring stuff to the gallery that to them symbolized freedom and to leave it there as part of the show. Um, we had a series of, um, of lectures and presentations on these histories from the neighborhood. This is a, um, a banner that recreates uh, a mural that was on the inside of San Francisco's first leather bar, um, the toolbox, and a kind of um, an important um, bar that uh, was featured in an article in 1962 in uh, Life magazine called Homosexual Homosexuality in America. It was the first positive um, depiction of a leather man in a national or international magazine at that time. So we were trying to turn the space of the exhibition into a space of production. Um, we had a series of performances. This is me uh, with a, my collaborator, Lolita Wolf. Um, she, uh, she is attaching a series of um, surgical staples to my arm and back. Um, connected to those staples are, um, are uh, these threads that are then connected to um, uh, ribbons. And then we had folks in the audience come up and unfurl the ribbons and tie them onto the banner in the back, and then I performed as a kind of um, inverted marionette. Um, here's the show from the next year, another sort of improvised um, sculpture show. Um, starting to look at the places in art institutions that are not necessarily associated with producing meaning, so like the bathroom or the back entrance, um, the places that are sort of uh, um, disregarded or discounted normally. So that's the gallery's bathroom that you could sort of peer into. A piece called Buddy Buddy. And part of what this show was looking at is the fact that um, galleries in Chelsea are ended up displacing um, uh, New York's leather bar community. Uh, that was what was in that, in, in that part of town um, before the galleries moved in there. So this is a sort of faux um, leather bar that I invented. Um, this is too long to talk to you about. I'm just not even gonna. It's, it's me inside of Pinky the Elephant, but Pinky's got a long story. I'll tell you some other time. a piece called The Chipmunk's Genuflect. Um, so now we're like 2014, a uh, project for ICP, the International Center of Photography, that looks at um, works from their collection around queerness and also looks at ICP's role as a space located in uh, Times Square. Uh, so one of the things that happened during the run of this show is um, I performed as this character, Victoria Spector, and uh, led a kind of tour and meditation of the spots around Times Square. Remember, I used that word, piquant. Um, when I used to go around in my teens and go to porn theaters and pick up guys and... So it was sort of like a revisiting of all of those spots that didn't exist anymore, a kind of haunting of, of contemporary Times Square. Um, the drawing sort of turned into these, uh, all these sort of self-portrait cartoony things. Um, I started posting these online. It's kind of the only way that they live, really. They don't... Um, and I, know, I don't really show the physical copies, I just show the online versions. Um, there we go. 
Um, and then a few years ago, um, I was um, lucky enough to be able to make um, a show with Claire um, Pentecost for um, Iceberg here in Chicago. Uh, and this is, this is the show that we put together. A uh, little gnome back room party with the disco ball there. Yep. Um, these uh, more of these cartoon self portraits. Um, for a while, these I was drawing these for um, a uh, art website called Hyperallergic. So I was sort of their weekly cartoonist. Um, and then we sort of took that character and turned him into a, uh, a toy called Cuddle Buddy. And so um, another collaborative project uh, with an artist um, named Liz Collins, all about the um, mending of this sock monkey. And then a project for um, 500 Cap Street in San Francisco, David Ireland's house. Uh, where I installed a uh, basically a back room and glory hole um, space in the garage. Um, last year, a uh, project for the new museum. Um, uh, for a long time now, I've been involved in the um, furry community. Um, this is uh, my fursona, Noman. Um, during the run of the show, um, I did a performance where I was in um, the suit as Noman, and uh, we uh, and I I offered um, buttons to people who would take the elevators with me. The button would say. Um, uh, tell your secret to the button and pin the button to Noman. So by the end of the show, um, basically I was kind of covered in these ribbons and bearing all of these other secrets from people. And then this is the most recent show that just opened um, at, uh, at Matthew Marks in Los Angeles. Um, it's called Nayland Blake's Opening. Um, and there's a series of these pieces um, that I'm calling vanities that are um, hanging mirrors and, uh, and little um, individual tables. Uh, a piece called Dream Body 2. Uh, Love Station. So all of these loves that you see here on these, um, these are all reproductions of a candle that my parents uh, gave me when I was eight years old. Um, so we made 60 of them, I'm about to be 60, um, and then uh, burned them down and made two bronze versions, which are the ones that are hanging on the shelf there. Uh, Dream Body One, Pink Posture, and a series of new uh, uh, sort of um, sort of paintings, except they're not at all. They're plexiglass um, uh, that has been uh, scraped and abraded, and are mirrors. And there we are. Um, that's a lot of stuff. I understand that we, we have, let's see, how are we doing here? 714. Yeah, I have 
Okay, we have around 15 minutes for questions. Um, and uh, I will try to, try to keep it um, to the, somewhat to the point. I do want to say maybe before, um, before we get into questions, um, this is a lot of stuff and, it's, and it's, um, it's, it looks sort of, to my mind right now, kind of raggedy. It's interesting, I'm preparing a retrospective. Um, and it's, uh, I think, I, I enjoy the fact that it kind of looks raggedy. And I want to talk just briefly to those of you who are students um, and, and to say that it is not ever your job to be finished. It is really your job to be present. Um, the, there's a thing that art making does that we desperately need at the present moment. Art making can make something be many different things at once. And we're living in a time where people, out of their fear, just want the right answer. They want to be the good student, or they want to be the bad student. They want to, be, they want to have a definition. They don't want to find that definition they want to just be able to announce it and be done with it. The thing that is so exciting to me about making art is that you're never done with it. That the best works of art allow us to go back to them over and over again and find different sorts of things in them. That they can be used by many different kinds of people in many different ways. And I think we only get to that when we're willing to be incomplete, when we're willing to own that, that, that multiple definition in a way. Um, so I see a lot of young people right now terrified of a world where um, you can say the wrong thing in the wrong public forum, and suddenly millions of people around the world are there to call you on your shit and tell you how terrible you are. That's an enormous burden to bear. And it's a very difficult one to be able to develop complex and, um, and, and, and rich ideas in the face of because a rich idea always makes you want to go, well, and this, and this too, and this, and this. And in the time that that takes, um, we see people um, uh, you know, kind of uh, destroyed online. Um, so you know, I know not everybody here is a student, but those of you that are, like you're embarked on a process that is really about bringing your truth into the world and manifesting that truth in the world. And that is an amazing thing and that is going to give hope to the other people who need that truth, even those who don't know it yet. But you do not have to decide what that truth is before you bring it into the world. The process of making that art is the process of finding that out. It is the process of thinking out loud with things that will bring you to places that will surprise you if you do it right and will continue to surprise you for the entirety of your life. That's what's valuable about the process. And that's the thing that kind of isn't captured in, the, in sort of binary media, that isn't captured in the desire to be like, right and be done with it. So you've given yourselves this time to be unfinished. Be willing to sit in that time. It's a powerful, powerful place to be. You know, 
don't ignore the stuff that gives you real pleasure because that's the stuff that's actually going to be able to fuel you as you go forward, right? Love stuff and ask yourself, why do I love that? Why am I enthusiastic about that? Figure that out. That's what the process of making work is about, so. So, do we have a question? Oh, we got somebody there. Yep, we got a we got a mic headed your way. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Zeus. Um, I have a two-part question. Mm -hmm. The first one is, I'm curious about the use of bunny rabbits specifically in mm -hmm. your work. Um, not just like all fuzzy animals, but I noticed a lot of bunnies in bad situations. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other question is, um, I'm curious about the emphasis on everydayness and like, doing something once a day every month. So yeah, that's my question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll do, I'll, I'll do the second part first. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a person who kind of needs a, a like I, ne I sort of need assignments. And, um, and, uh, I'm also a person who has, uh, has struggled with addiction in various forms. And one of the big hallmarks of an addict is that the, our first idea is not to go to the thing that actually feeds us. That anything else becomes easy, easy, easier to do than the thing that is actually going to nourish and sustain us. So for me, making art nourishes and sustains me. And um, when I'm feeling anxious about something, the easiest thing for me to do is to do anything other than making art. So I was at a place about five years ago where I spent so much time working as an administrator, working on other projects, that I basically was like, am I even an artist anymore? Do I even make anything? And it was like late December, and so I decided, okay, here's the deal. Once a day, I'm gonna make a drawing. And it doesn't matter if it's like 11.59 and, I'm, and I make like, I, and I scribble on a piece of paper like bad drawing. That's fine. The point is doing that every day. Um, because it's, it was sort of the denial of my connection with my own thought that was, putting me in that place of doubt and anxiety. So for me, the assignments is like, and doing things regularly is the antidote to the sort of grandiosity of like, how are we going to grapple with the terrible issues of our day? How are, you know, I mean, it's I'm, not a joke, right? You get up and you get on Twitter and like, you can count in like the seconds how long it takes you to feel bad about being in the world. Um, and, uh, and so, what's the antidote to that? Well, the antidote to that is all of the people throughout history, I mean, I love that, that, that Merle is coming, because what an example, right? Somebody who focuses on the, not the grandiose ideas that oh, we are now making art, so it's super important. I am the bearer of Western civilization, and thus, you know, everything I do is, um, but no, it's like people who get up every day and provide an example of their own brilliance in some tiny way, that's the stuff that feeds us. That's the example that we can actually use, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why like media representations of artists are useless, right? If you want to become an artist, because 
it doesn't look like anything to make art. It's not photogenic. <laughs> it's a lot of like sitting around and trying to figure out whether or not like two colors that you put on a palette are actually gonna make sense on this thing, right? It's a lot of scraping down canvases. It's not, it, you know, so, um, so, so that's that part of it. To me, the, the daily assignment is the antidote to my own pomposity, right? Like just get up and do it and don't worry about whether or not it's, like the thing, the contract I made myself with myself was not, it had to be a good drawing, it just had to be a drawing. And then the rabbit thing, um, I usually talk about it as a way of talking about the way that we talk about content in work, particularly in art school, is to my mind kind of screwed up. Um, I uh, used to do these performances. They were sort of found text performances. This is in like the late 80s and I would wear like a prom dress that I found at a thrift store and like read this text. It was very punky, and, you know, before Courtney Love ruined it for everybody. Um, and, um, and at one point I was gonna do one of these things and it was like, okay, guys in prom dresses, little, little played out. So I needed a new costume and I was walking by this magic store I saw a rabbit costume. The whole piece was about witchiness and magic and stuff. And I was like, oh great, I'll be like the rabbit in the hat. So, you know, got the rabbit suit, did the performance. And then my process is that I will do something and then I will ask myself, okay, what felt right about that and why did it feel right? And so I started to kind of research rabbits and make work that used more rabbits. And so the first thing that came to mind was like, well, you know, rabbits, they're like, uh, they're known for two things. They're known for like fucking a lot, and they're known for shitting a lot, right? So at that time, like in the, you know, early 90s, it's like, well, who else gets talked about that way? Like gay men, right? They're having like dirty anal sex and they're having lots of it. So I made a lot of pieces where the rabbits were kind of metaphors for gay men, right? And then I started to ask myself, okay, what's the, where have I encountered rabbits like in my past? And the thing that immediately came to mind is um, my grandfather used to read me Uncle Wiggly stories. Um, we used to, I used to watch Bugs Bunny cartoons and he used to um, uh, read Uncle Remus stories to me, right? Um, so the Uncle Remus stories, uh, these Joel Chandler Harris stories, which no one reads anymore for a very good reason, um, uh, are actually, they're a white person's version of West African folk tales. Um, and so that character of the kind of trickster rabbit is a character that comes to the U.S with slaves, right? And I started thinking about Bugs Bunny and how Bugs Bunny is a gray rabbit, right? And Bugs Bunny often appears in drag, but he also often is like singing songs and playing a banjo. And what songs are he singing? He's singing Camp Town, La you know, he's singing Camp Town Races. He's singing like Swanee. Well, these are like minstrel songs, right? So there's a way that that character is an extension of minstrelry in the, in the US. And so I started making work that was about the way that there's a kind of racial ambivalence in the rabbit. And the rabbit's becoming these figures for, um, for, for um, racial ambivalence and, and my own um, racial history, right? This, the grandfather who read those stories to me is on my dad's side. So it's the black, you know, my, my black grandfather. And, um, and, though, and then finally I was doing the, um, the, uh, the, the Invisible Man installation and I realized like, oh, I want to include a family picture in there. And I remember there's like a family picture of my mom and my dad and myself with like a stuffed rabbit from when I was like four or five or something like that. And so I was going through family photos and found this other picture of myself with a live rabbit from like a year after, right? And I suddenly remembered that as a kid, I had been given a live rabbit at, at Easter. Um, 
and that the rabbit had killed itself. Um, that it had, my grandfather, same grandfather, had built a kind of hutch for it and it had got his head caught and died. So I tell you that whole story, not that you should feel bad for me, but of course, please feel bad for me. Um, <laughs> I tell you that whole story because in art school, what you're supposed to say is, well, there's rabbits in my work because as a child I had this traumatic experience where a rabbit that I had died and that was that, you know, and ever since rabbits have had an incredibly important message for me. I didn't access that memory until I had made all of this other work until I had done all of this other research into things that were not part of my actual childhood, right? Um, and I think that that's the way that content actually functions in work. That it's not like you have some perfect essence of yourself that you're going to squeeze out like a, ta like a like toothpaste, you know, into the world, but rather that as you ask yourself questions about the things that you make, you get to find all of these different ramifications about what might draw you to something in the beginning. I, re I literally like did not have that memory until I found that picture like years after working with that. So, do we have time for any others? Yeah. Hello, my name is Esra. And I was wondering, I had a question like regarding the interactive pieces that you had. Uh, what's the effect of involving audience or the public on your artwork, like both on a personal level, like how you view your artwork before and after um, like the public interact with it? And what's the significance of just like having the audience contribute to this? Um, I think that, um, well, there's a couple of things. Usually my performances are kind of structured so that I, even though it seems like I'm the center of them, I'm actually the occasion for other people to do things. So in the Gorge performance, I sit at a table with a bunch of food behind me and it says like, please feed. And then the audience feeds me for an hour and whatever they feed me, I will, I, I will eat. And even audience is like a weird word to use. The people who attend, whatever, whatever they give me. So it ends up, I'm actually quite passive in that situation. And it all becomes about them kind of performing for each other, like how it is that they're going to feed me. And at a certain point, they, somebody realizes like, oh, he's not gonna drink water on his own unless somebody gives him water. So as a group, people have to sort of decide like, are they going to care for me? Are they going to, um, in this situation, how are they going to exercise their power? And to me, that's the most interesting part, right? Um, in the Noman performance, I'm not saying anything. It all becomes about people like talking to each other and being like, well, I don't have any secrets. I can't really share any secrets with this person. Like, you know, and, and then other people like getting, you know, sort of getting into it. And um, I think overall in terms of the, sort of socialization around works of art, I'm much more interested in um, it being us together, what would we do? Like the, like the thing that I kind of hate more than anything else in an art school context is someone who says, um, yeah, well, this piece was like all of this, but what if somebody from the real world came in who didn't know anything about art and they saw this piece? And A, there is no person who knows nothing about art. That person doesn't exist. And B, we can't ask them. They're not in the room. So really what you're doing there is you're ditching your own responsibility to respond to the work by coming up with this theoretical person who isn't around, right, and can't be verified either way. 
I think it's tough for us to be able to articulate our experience. And so that's why I sort of balk at the term audience because it implies somebody who just sits and listens and has an experience that's closed off from everything else. But the truth is like when you go to the theater, people in the seats make the play happen as much as the people on the stage. You know, the play doesn't end until everybody pl applauds, right? That's something that we all agree to do together. And so I'm interested in creating situations where we get to experience each other's power as creators and perceivers in a way that is pleasurable and fluid. That's what's exciting to me. I don't have to be um, driving the car all the time. I don't have to be in charge. It's interesting to me and exciting and thrilling to me to see like when someone else takes the wheel and goes to a place. Um, and, and, and everybody in the room sort of feels it, right? Like when you go to a really good party and everybody there is sort of like bringing that energy into it, that's, that's like the best stuff, you know? And that's the stuff that art history is actually made out of, is people like entertaining themselves. Um, I just sort of wanna like I just quickly like thinking about folks who are, well, thinking about like the Bay Area people, we were in a marginalized situation that nobody else wanted, right? People were literally on TV talking about they did not care if everybody died, everybody that I cared for, right? Um, we're, we're in a similar situation now, right? Where we have a government that is actively seeking to kill off people, would be so happy if people died. What do you do in the face of that? Well, you go and yell at that government, that's one thing that you do, but you also like gather around and create joy for those people who are around you. And it's harder to do that if you're thinking of that as an audience, right? It's easier to do that when you're thinking of it's us. What are we going to do together? What do I have the power to bring into being at this moment that we can like connect with and create together? And, and really, I believe that is how like art history gets made. Those are, the, those are the exciting intellectual moments where people are like thrilled to be around each other and that they wish that they were there. So. Thank you.